Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to PTV World. I'm Tayyaba Nasar Khan and you're watching Perspective. Today we're going to talk about the Kashmir Solidarity Day which is going to be held tomorrow. And of course we do call this as a Black Day as well. The Kashmiris themselves, they call it as a Black Day as well. We call it as a Solidarity Day because Pakistan of course has been standing in solidarity with Kashmir for the past many, many decades as well. And of course, Kashmiris call it as a black day because they have been suffering under the illegal occupation of India in the occupied valley for the past 76 years. We've seen how India has unilaterally taken the decisions against the United Nations Security Council resolutions of 1948, 1949. And not just that, but also against the Simla Agreement of 1971, against the Lahore Declaration of 1999, and abrogated Article 370, which gave the power of Kash to Kashmiris to have an independent status. But unfortunately, they have been stripped off of their independent status as well and not just that but also the fact that there has been so much brutality going on over there as well many people say that that is the largest open air prison of course we do know what's going on in gaza right now uh, it, it is also one of the largest prisons as well before the gaza, gaza's prison there was kashmir which was the largest prison on the entire earth uh, when the abrogation on August 5, 2019 took place, uh, the abrogation of Article 370 and Article uh, 6 as well, we've, we've seen that there were about 700,000 troops, Indian troops, present in the uh, area of Kashmir, in the Ill Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. And of course, today we've seen that about 150,000 troops are present. After the uh, abrogation, there were 35,000 troops which were already sent really fast as well. But after the abrogation, uh, of course, to curb the protests that were happening, they had to send it and make it the largest open-air prison with 700,000 troops. Of course, that's a very alarming number as well. Right now, 150,000 troops, according to the KMS uh, reports, suggest that this is, of course, one of the very significant, uh, significant open-air prisons that you can call as well. But not just that, a lot of human rights atrocities have been taking place. We've been seeing pellet guns, the use of pellet guns, children being blinded, men, women, they, them being blinded as well. And not just that, we've seen many other atrocities taking place like cluster bombs, what they call it as toy bombs, also uh, being thrown around and the children playing with them and of course being killed after they played with the cluster bombs as well. And not just that, of course, we have the shooting at crowds, desecration of the mass graves as well. Everything's been happening all under the eyes of the international community. I have literally no idea what to say because this is such a heinous crime that India is committing and no one is really taking a heed to what they're doing. Of course, finally, the issue of the, um, uh, the their involvement in killing of six is rising, which is a good thing. Canada is taking up the stance. The US has taken up the stance as well. But the people of Kashmir still fail to understand why the international community, apart from the journalistic community that is, the international community and the governments are not taking as big of a stand as they probably should as well. But of course, not just that. We've seen that India has killed about 0 0.5 million people, million Kashmiris uh, in the past 76 as well and uh, 76 years that is and about 3.5 million Kashmiris have been forced to come to Azad, Jammu and Kashmir due to all the atrocities that have been going on there as well. Just a few more statistics that I'd like to give out to our audience as well before we move on to our guests. Uh, about, and these are from the KMS, Kashmir Media Service, that is. About 7,000 custodial killings have taken place. About 168,000 civilians have been arrested in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. Moreover, 110,000 houses and infrastructure has been desecrated or completely destroyed. Moreover, 22,900 women have been widowed, 110,900 orphans have been made, the children have been orphaned as well. And not just that, ladies and gentlemen, many women have been raped as well. About 11,000 women have been raped. We know the incident of Kunal Pushpura in 2001, where 100 women were raped in a single day. And that has been happening all under the eye, with no one batting an eye, by the way under the eye of the international community as well. We have been joined by our honored guests for this show as well. Mr. Abez bin Vasi, who is the Kashmiri leader, is sitting on my right. And along with him, I have been joined by Mr. Sajjad Ghazmi, who is a journalist. Uh, thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for joining us, of course. Uh, we will later be joined by the 
ex former minister of the AJK Assembly as well, Ms. Farzana Yaku, but we will be joined and we will let you inform you once she joins us as well. But let's go on towards Mr. Aves. Uh, Mr. Aves, you are a Kashmiri leader. You have seen what has been going on in Kashmir for the past 76 years. We've seen how BJP has been winning on their, uh, their, their narrative of anti Muslim rhetoric. And we've seen how Kashmir has become that, that uh, unfortunate place which has been carrying out this rhetoric as well, which has seen the rhetoric being carried out on themselves as well. As a, as a Kashmiri leader yourself, as an activist yourself, um, and as a person who's seen so many people coming from the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir to Azad Jammu and Kashmir to have some more uh, self, uh, self, self resilience, of course, to have some more uh, self respect in Pakistan as well. Uh, what are your sentiments regarding another Kashmir Solidarity Day that has come in 2024? Uh, thank you so much for uh, such a comprehensive introduction uh, of the uh, uh, plight of Kashmiri, especially in the beginning you have portrayed the uh, grim picture uh, of uh, Jammu and Kashmir, what is happening over there. I think that uh, this day, 5th of uh, February uh, 2023, it has uh, been uh, observing since 1990 to extend solidarity uh, to the people of Kashmir, to their just struggle, to the right of uh, self-determination. And uh, this was uh, decided in 1990 that there should be a particular day to commemorate and to observe that uh, uh, Pakistan's uh, commitment and uh, Pakistan could reaffirm its uh, stance and its position on Jammu and Kashmir. But I think this is not a matter of one day as far as Pakistan's state is concerned or Pakistan's um, people are concerned that every day that they are extending their solidarity to the people of Jammu and Kashmir. But today that is a peculiar uh, moment, that is a particular day within the country hmm. and across the world where Pakistanis are living, they are extending their support to the Kashmiri cause. Uh, coming back to your question that uh, the feelings and sentiments, there are two you know, uh, perspectives that I would like to advance. Number one is that uh, on the one hand, the persecution is uh, taking place. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you have very rightly mentioned in the beginning, that uh, mm, around uh, 900,000 forces have been deployed over there. Mm -hmm. Around uh, uh, 40, uh, uh, you know, thousand, uh, uh, you know, people they have been, uh, so some of them, they have been disappeared, widowed, half widowed, half uh, mother. So that is the uh, plight of uh, Kashmiris over there. But on the other side, there is a silver lining. Mm. And that silver lining is that uh, despite uh, so much repression and pressure by Indian authorities mm. and uh, brutal regime led by Narendra Modi, uh, the sentiment mm. Uh, and the urge and quest hmm. for freedom that is not only still alive, but that has been uh, transferred to the younger generation. Hmm. And uh, this is something which is very positive that uh, uh, after the lapse of uh, over 75 years, still uh, I think that this uh, sentiment has been intensified. It has been in increased. And uh, despite making all tactics and all pressure and all brutalities, India perhaps uh, so far is not able to douse the fire of freedom that is igniting among the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Right. Uh, this is very interesting because 76 years of persecution that the people of Kashmir have seen and they've also faced as well the years of brutality as well. And despite that, the people stand very resilient as well. We've also been joined by Ms. Farzana Yaqub, who's a foreign, uh, former minister uh, in the AJK Assembly as well. Welcome to PTV World. I'm going to take up the next question towards you uh, and talk about the legalities of the issue as well. Of course, we know that the United Nations Security Council resolutions 1948, 1949, Geneva Conventions as well. And not just that, but also if you talk about just Kashmir issue, the Simla Agreement as well as Lahore Declaration, talking about not taking any unilateral stance on the people of Kashmir as well. And then after that, the brutality continues, which is, of course, against the Geneva Conventions. So despite all of these legalities in place, why is India still so eager to continue the violence on the people of Kashmir? And also, 
it's so easy for them to do so in the international community. Well, uh, it's not just about Kashmir and what India is doing in Kashmir. It is what we see have happening in other places as well. In the recent most uh, instances, uh, what is happening in Palestine. So there is a separate set of rules uh, for, for the countries uh, where the West is interested. And then there is a completely separate set of rules where the West is not interested. Now, India happens to be a good trade partner uh, for the West, and by the West, I clearly mean uh, the United States of America, because the other uh, developed countries tend to toe the line that America uh, sets out for them. So what we have seen is that uh, America loves to preach about peace and democracy, but only in the countries where it wants its vested interests to flourish. In Kashmir, America does not see its interests and so we see that it it lets all of this happen uh, be it uh, united nations resolutions or discussions in european parliaments or within uh, 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 the uh, oic that it's only talk that happens uh, the, the leaders do say that uh, kashmir uh, the the conflict of kashmir uh, is just and that the people of uh, the uh, indian occupied kashmir as well as the whole state have the right for plebiscite and to choose which country they would want to be part part of. Uh, but that's where it ends. Uh, there is no end to the Indian repression uh, that we see. There is no end or decrease to the human rights abuses that we see uh, occurring in the Indian occupied Kashmir by the uh, Indian state. And we also see that uh, the Kashmiris are unable, have not really uh, 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 been been able to c uh, come out as much as they would want to because the repression has increased. India says that it is investing in the Indian occupied Kashmir. It boasts about the money that it is uh, putting uh, into Kashmir, the developments that are taking place in Kashmir. But at the same time, what we see is that it is unable to remove the number of uh, military deployed over there. It is unable to decrease that. It has not made the life of any Kashmiri easier. There are still blockades. Kashmiris do go through uh, frisking and checking. So the, so the international world has clearly shown that it is sadly not interested in uh, fixing these human rights abuses and issues. Why? Because India is their friend, just like Israel is their friend and they must protect it. Ms. Farzana, of course we do know, uh, talking about the legalities again, there is a United Nations 2005 World Outcome document which talks about responsibility to protect. Uh, it's a legal term which they use for those countries, against those countries rather, who are perpetrating violence on their own people to protect those people and the minority from uh, suffering from those violence as well. So is there a possibility that all the world can come together under this uh, document, under this responsibility to protect doctrine? and uh, save the Kashmiris from the Indian atrocities? I think Kashmiris themselves, inshallah, one day will be able to save ourselves. As of now, I will be really honest. And uh, once again, I look at Palestine. I don't see the world can do anything. Uh, United Nations has been unable to send its own aid. United Nations has been toothless in this whole repression and this war that Israel is waging against Palestine, how can we expect it to do anything to Kashmiris? So we the people of Kashmir, inshallah, we will be able to come out of this repression. Uh, this is the fifth generation that is involved in this conflict. And what you will see is that Kashmiris have not, lot, not lost hope. Kashmiris have not given up on their right of plebiscite, on the right of self-determination. And that is what keeps us hopeful that, inshallah, we will achieve what we want to achieve. And the aspirations are still running high. And our people are extremely brave that they have been able to face the brunt of the forces of the uh, Indian forces in Indian-occupied Kashmir.
Right, Farzana, I really salute you and all of the Kashmiris' uh, resilience. And of course, I wish that you didn't have to be resilient, but in the face of this uh, violence, of course, you have to be. Uh, and we're all really proud of you and everybody else who are resilient in the face of the brutalities as well. Sajad, let's go towards you now. Uh, of course, we've seen that a lot of settlement has been taking place uh, regarding the resettlement of the Indians from other parts of the country to uh, the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir as well. They're trying to change the demography of the Kashmir in itself. And they have been successful to a certain part by changing the demography of a certain part as well. Um, is there a possibility to put a stop on this demographic change? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, it's a uh, really bone of contention between both Pakistan and India specifically. And also it's not uh, threatening the peace between these uh, two nations, but uh, uh, around the uh, this region uh, more um, mostly and uh, also i would like to say uh, there are there are like 20 resolution have been passed by united nations security council so far but what's the uh, what's out uh, you can say conclusion from them what's out back uh, what's like result after those um, resolution there is nothing been done uh, after those resolution so i i think uh, after those resolution i think we need to have like more proactive diplomatically uh, that uh, diplomatic front that we can counter this narrative. Whenever th there is election in the India, they come up with more uh, their pro right wing uh, narrative, and they come up uh, against any. Uh, specifically, if we talk about the, uh, the right now, uh, they are like uh, they have recently exhibited a new temple on just a, pl a place of, uh, which was like uh, was Masjid. for the Babri Masjid. Uh, so, so I think uh, we need to uh, add a higher, a proactive approach, and I think we not uh, have to be fo only focusing on. Uh, West and but we have to focus on I think our ground realities as well. We need to support a resistance of uh, Kashmiris as well because this is not uh, only uh, questioning uh, about uh, their uh, right, but it's they have definitely if they will be uh, snatching the, that area, they will be coming up back on the Azad Kashmir section too. So it's uh, almost uh, ten, uh, almost ten million people living in that area, and which is like 55 percent of this specific region land uh, being annexed by India. So I think uh, the whole world knows it. And also, uh, India don't allow third party to come in this uh, conflict specifically. And we keep uh, continuously focusing on diplomatic. Uh, diplomatically, we are focusing that we need to come up. Uh, we need to uh, like adhere the uh, diplomatic rule and norms uh, to f fix this issue. But it will not be fixed like this. We need to come up with more proactive approach. We need to support the resistance specifically. Just take example of Azerbaijan, Nagorno, and uh, other reg uh, other conflict. They uh, they just uh, to, uh, they are like like ending up this uh, conflict by going uh, into uh, practically not only focusing on diplomatic, uh, but we I think uh, we do have to have like a diplomatic uh, front. Uh, which is which is like <laughs> part and parcel these days, but yes, we have to support the resistance movement at the same time. And also, I will uh, definitely be uh, looking up, uh, for the next coming government, which will definitely be focusing on their foreign p uh, policy, which, which is like just isolated, uh, like if we talk about last uh, few months. So I think <coughs> this uh, strong and stable government can go uh, uh, by their uh, strong uh, narrative, uh, which West can buy, and definitely West knows it. And if we 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 don't have to f uh, focus that we just need to know this uh, uh, conflict, but we have to focus on how to fix it. Actually, I mean the practical uh, uh, practical uh, steps need to be uh, taken by the Pakistan. Also, Pakistan need to uh, go up. Just take example of Iran, which was the only country who just come up very first uh, first first time uh, in support of uh, Kashmir. But they do have a trade uh, relation, and they, they do have uh, so so many. Our projects together with the India, but I think they're still supporting it. But we, what we have to do is to support them and to take them on a one uh, platform, and then uh, keep on triggering uh, India to go for the conclusion specifically. And I, th I think uh, there, there are two or three uh, different uh, the think tank is right now working in Pakistan, and I think they need to uh, given more. Uh, in, in this range, uh, range that they can uh, go in Europe specifically, they can like go for lobbying and they can also have uh, like they can portray what is happening right now in this region specifically. And if we, if we talk about stats, uh, which says that almost uh, 110,000 people have been martyred so far. And, and the more damaging is like 10 percent are those uh, killing which was like uh, uh, you can say custodial uh, killing which you can say uh, wasn't given any uh, legal platform to go for their legal rights to exercise their legal rights but they was le being killed by the Indian occupied uh, forces. I think uh, almost uh, 100,000 shops uh, were being bu burned so far. So I mean these are not 100,000 uh, 100, shops but 100,000 of families which definitely 
directly influenced by this um, uh, act of, of heinous. So I think uh, Pakistan, uh, st uh, strong Pakistan will definitely lead towards a strong uh, narrative of Pakistan at the same time. So I think, uh, yeah, w we need to, uh, I, I think we have to focus on this uh, front as well. And we need to know that there will be election in April uh, in India specifically. So with before that, they might go for any more a false fl a flag operation too. So I think mm -hmm. we need to uh, be uh, more proactive in a sense, and we need to be more uh, like uh, aggressive in, the, in on this platform specifically that we can like uh, uh, we can support uh, at the same time to the Kashmiri, and also we can like control and we can re uh, we can like resist uh, firmly against uh, Indian occupation. Right, right, Sajjad. You've mentioned some very interesting points as well, but of course we talk about not looking always towards the West as well. And I think I'm going to carry out this conversation, carry on this conversation rather with the West. Uh, of us, we've seen that uh, the West has been given a lot of power in this uh, regard, regarding the dispute of Kashmir, regarding lobbying for Kashmir again, again um, and also lobbying against India as well. Uh, but we've also seen at a time when the nationalistic policies are growing, when the deglobalization is happening as well, there is the front of the East and of course uh, the SCO, for instance, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries, uh, we can also look towards the East where many multiple powers are coming up such as China in itself um, and them taking a very significant stand in building cooperation and building dialogues between different countries. For instance, their success story in building dialogue between Saudi and Iran as well. So do you happen to see any other country apart from the West as well, such as China, such as Russia in, uh, in this regard, uh, taking up the dialogue between the Kashmiris, India and Pakistan? You know, the uh, the uh, current situation, current uh, global order, if you see, and uh, we see, you know, quite uh, uh, disappointing phenomenon, quite unfortunate that the West, which uh, claims to be the flag bearer of uh, human rights, uh, protection of human rights, but when it comes to uh, issue of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, their claims evaporate into thin air. So they couldn't uh, translate those claims into reality when uh, there is uh, Kashmir or uh, when it comes to uh, India. Because there are some uh, regional interests which are being advanced by the global powers. And earlier, when United Nations resolutions, uh, uh, particularly UNSC resolutions adopted in 1940s and 1950s, 57 and 51 also, so at that time, uh, we had uh, a kind of strategic partner with the United States through CETO and CENTO and defense pacts were signed. And at that time, perhaps we were in the right side of the history and uh, these U UN res UNSC resolutions were adopted uh, based on principles of justice and fair play. But after 1988, after the Plessler Amendment and especially after 9-11, uh, perhaps these uh, powers led by uh, United States of America, uh, they see this region from the uh, earlier they were looking security after 9-11 from the security perspective, mm. from the FPAC perspective and in order to uh, resolve uh, the issue of Afghanistan, they at times, uh, you know, introduced this idea of mediation in Obama administration twice in one, uh, in uh, both the campaigns of uh, Obama, they mention about the mediation and then Richard Holbrook, uh, the Kashmir brief was supposed to be included, but due to pressure of India, they dropped it. So uh, again, uh, when we look with the benefit of hindsight, so uh, we can say that that was uh, uh, being done to serve the FPAC strategy and to that interest. And now there is another uh, thing that was also uh, in place at that time was Asia Pacific curtailment of China. So now whatever they are doing and the kind of uh, silence uh, we see on the part of uh, United States of America because of this, uh, you know, uh, curtailment and encirclement of China. And I don't uh, see any, uh, any uh, you know, prospect or any positive expectation from these Western centers that they could play some uh, role in resolving that issue because uh, for the past many years, what I believe is that they try to 
uh, manage the conflict. Uh, they are perhaps not interested mm. to resolve this conflict. Mm. So as you have pointed out in your question that SCO and other uh, regional organization, I think that we should focus on East and China and Russia and uh, some other uh, potential countries which could uh, play some role to maintain peace between India and Pakistan by resolution of Kashmir right, issue. Right, right. We've seen that South Africa as well has come up as the pioneer of uh, taking up the case of the genocide against uh, Palestinians and against Gaza in the recent ICJ uh, hearings as well. Um, all these countries which are becoming larger powers, they're growing into powers as well in this multilateral system that we've seen that is uh, coming out of the unipolar polar system. Um, how can we go about going to these powers and demanding the rights of the Kashmiris and ensuring that they actually hear because we've seen that they are taking steps towards the right direction. Yes, uh, I think that there are two things which uh, uh, we should take into consideration. Number one is that is uh, perhaps not directly related, that is indirectly related, but there is a, a tendential uh, you know, connection uh, with regard to our policy on Kashmir, that is our house in order. That mm. is the need of the hour. For example, our economic wars, our uh, political issues, and other um, uh, crises that we are facing, they need to be fixed, uh, mm. uh, you know, earliest, number one. Second thing is about the uh, uh, robust diplomacy, mm. which is need of the hour. Uh, and in that robust diplomacy, the first part is to uh, generate that uh, literature which could impress and which could influence the international community. For example, legal or uh, um, uh, lawfare mm -hmm. that has been persistently, persistently talked about recently uh, by uh, different intellectuals. Others, uh, yes. uh, so I think that that uh, ought to be done. Mm -hmm. And secondly, our foreign missions uh, uh, based in Western countries and other uh, states, I think they should play more proactive role. Uh, it should not be restricted to only some days and they should issue some cliche-ridden cliche -ridden statements. I think they should come up with uh, something which is uh, more convincing, mm. something which is uh, more persuasive, mm. something which uh, could be presented in the idiom of the day mm. and something which could be taken seriously by international community. There is a lot of uh, room for improvement mm. to inf as far as uh, generating discourse is concerned. Mm. And once it is being generated, once it is being developed, then I think that all possible uh, media outlets, all possible outlets could be exploited mm. to propagate it, to mm. showcase it. So right. far, the, this, is, this is a vacuum, uh, mm. this is a lacuna, this is a limitation on our, mm. m on our part. And I think it uh, needs to be fixed because, uh, for example, that uh, n uh, uh, as far as uh, legal position is concerned, mm. Pakistan is uh, Pakistan has always been an advantageous position. Position mm. Pakistan has locus standi. Pakistan has, uh, you know, uh, internationally, uh, you know, recognized legitimate position with that uh, with that issue. W then there are some other issues of human rights, particularly related to women, mm. related to children, mm. related to environmental degradation, mm. re re related to uh, psychological trauma and post-traumatic disorders, such things. I think that uh, if these things are uh, uh, properly propagated and properly communicated mm. to the world, I believe that the world would uh, uh, consider consider it and take cognizance of what is happening over there. Yeah. Uh, what we need to do is the proper projection and uh, proper showcasing of this case to right. the international community, both the societies mm. as well as to the state. Right, uh, Aves, you've talked about very interesting concepts as well. You've talked about, you've uh, driven away from hard concepts to soft concepts as well, which is, I think, very interesting as well in order to take up the stance of Kashmir. Let's go to Farzana now. Uh, Farzana, I'm going to come towards the soft topics over here. Mr. Aves has talked about uh, the, the generation of literature. He's talked about the environmental degradation and the PTSD uh, that many Kashmiris are facing as well. And if we talk about these areas, uh, what can the world do or how can we ensure that, for instance, top educational institutions ensure a certain presence of the Kashmiri children 
uh, in their universities as well, or they give their, uh, the scholarships out to them, for instance, or for instance, allocating certain um, uh, papers to, to Kashmir cause as well, and to talk about the realities of Kashmir and the research papers as well. So how can we ensure that there's a generation of literature, there's a generation of scholarship, and talking about all these real matters uh, that lie within Kashmir? So we currently have five universities in Azad Jammu Kashmir and this work is taking place. Uh, it takes time to create content of a level that can be at par uh, with the international arena. Also what we see and we've always been cognizant of is that whenever you will uh, want to search about Kashmir, Indian content comes up. That is because they've been working on this for so long that there is a plethora of Indian uh, device content and it always comes up at the top. Uh, so Kashmiris are working on this. Uh, our youngsters are more vibrant, more intelligent and way more braver than, than us the pre previous generation. I would like to take up, uh, I would like to share something uh, that the, the, the lawyers of uh, Indian occupied Kashmir have uh, filed a few cases uh, this is uh, being discussed uh, by the previous speaker, uh, Mr. Awais. So, so international jurisdictions such as UK and America. Now, these young lawyers are filing cases. You can't, we can't be filing cases against the government of India, but we can file cases against individuals. So I would take up this opportunity that via this platform of PTV World that people must find out that uh, documentation has been taking place for a very long time of the uh, human rights violations that are taking place. And, and these, uh, these documentations are available. People can file uh, cases against individuals. Nasir Qadri is a very famous lawyer who has filed such cases. And, and so there are these new upcoming think tanks and organizations, which are once again, as you, uh, as you were asking me, that they are creating content which is uh, really important, uh, which, which documents uh, the, the, the effects of climate change in this conflict area, the, the, the fact that we are unable to uh, bring in uh, interventions that could improve not only the flora and fauna, but also the lives of uh, animals that, that live within this region, they, they, they are unable to move. So, so, so it is such a sad state of uh, affairs that uh, the, the humans are restricted from movement. Even the animals are restricted uh, from movement because within this small area, there are so many barbed wires that uh, 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 there is no freedom of movement. Uh, similarly, there is no freedom of expression. But even then, Kashmiris have been exceptionally brave. And, and uh, the journalists of Indian Occupied Kashmir, they have done phenomenal work. And for that, they have been receiving international awards and recognition. Uh, Parvina Ahangar and Parvez Imbos, they have received a Craft to Peace Award. Very few people know of the heroes and heroines uh, of, of Kashmir who have been at the forefront uh, with their pens. You see, we remember people who are out there protesting. We remember people who have given their lives to this cause. We must also remember people who have written about it. We have famous poets by, such as Agha Shahid. We have these amazing personalities who have been writing about uh, Kashmir. There is literature, there is poetry. And even now we have young, fresh blood, which is doing the same. One, we need to reconnect with the roots. Uh, we need people to find out about ourselves. The, we, we're seen as a burden, but Kashmir is a whole culture. It's a whole society. And there is so much that people need to find out about us. So yes, the content is there, but it is not at the top of the search uh, list, and we need more content. So these organizations, this new, fresh, young blood is working on it, and uh, they're doing a good job. And I hope that you know, as uh, as 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 this content accumulates, we are able to uh, fight back uh, by uh, you know telling the world truth uh, and being able to access international research journals to have our uh, re uh, research uh, um, papers, research papers to be um, part of those international research uh, journals. So all of this work is going on at the moment within the universities of Azad Jammu Kashmir, in think tanks, and also in Indian-occupied Kashmir universities. Right.
Right. And Farzana, let's move outside of Kashmir as well and go towards large MNCs, large organizations, large educational institutions that are uh, based, for instance, in the US, UK, in uh, the West, as well as the East as well. And all of these universities, is there a way that the Kashmiri leaders can apply pressure? Uh, I wouldn't say diplomatic pressure, but I would say apply pressure on these private institutions to uh, create a certain amount or quota for the Kashmiri children, for instance, to study, or certain other activities such as focusing on the mental health related issues over there, or focusing on the environmental and climate related issues over there. Is there a possibility that the Kashmiri leaders can ensure the representation of Kashmir in these private institutions around the world? Uh, as far as I know, uh, there are no quota systems in the international education system. So I am not really sure if we can pull our weight in that manner. But what we can do is that we have brilliant students uh, who can get admissions into the best of the best universities or, or not even the best. But, you know, our students are going out and studying. We have a very robust diaspora in UK, in Europe, in America as well. These people, I'm sure they can put in the pressure to their local uh, legislators to speak about Kashmir. And the students who are studying in those universities, they can take up these projects and um, work on, on, on such research projects. There are very few uh, research, uh, papers that have been uh, such researches have been conducted. Uh, there, there, there's a few in, uh, in the Stanford University. So, so this work has been going on, but not in the kind of numbers that we would want. So uh, answer to your question, I am not really sure that, you know, in, uh, the Kashmiri leadership can pressurize our way into getting a quota for our students. But what we can do is that we have complete faith in our students. They're brilliant. They can get their admissions. And once they're over there, they can take up the researches that uh, that that look towards Kashmir and the different uh, aspects of the Kashmir conflict, uh, as right. you mentioned, climate change, Maybe the mental health from... issues uh, is is a very very important and 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 a priority for everyone because you know after 75 years there is a lot of PTSD issues, so their uh, um, work is going on and it needs to improve and enhanced. Uh, so more students in those universities. Right. Maybe maybe somebody from Kashmir can rise up to the power of having a Nobel Prize or going to the power of Malala Yousafzai and then making targeted scholarships for the people of Kashmir as well. And of course, a targeted audience that is Kashmir and helping them through different private organizations as well. But of course, Sajad, let's talk about uh, the humanitarian violations that are being taken place right now in Kashmir. And I'm not talking about the hardcore humanitarian violations that are taking place, the killings that are real, the, the killings and the desecration of the mass graves and the pellet guns, et cetera, et cetera, which is all very real. But I'm also talking about how there has been an internet blockade, how many children were unable to um, uh, continue their work because a freelance industry is very, very uh, common these days and they were unable to con continue their economic activities due to that as well and the general irons blockade that we saw the internet blockade that we saw and of course the restrictions on going and frisking as well as Farzana has mentioned um, so is there is there a way that um, I wouldn't say about the international community's presence because we've already talked about that but is there a way that India in itself can realize that this is something which is a violation of the human rights and it's wrong I think they will not realize uh, by themselves. I think we need to come up with a plan. You can call it a five-year plan. And we have to uh, make our goals. We need to set our goals and aims, what we will be chasing in this five years. And uh, yeah, all the panelists was agreed uh, that we need to come up to influence uh, international arena. That's fine. But uh, the practical step is uh, the lead of the time, I think. And yes, we need to look for the welfare of those people who are living in that area, approx uh, approximately more than uh, 10 million people living there and also 3 million people living in Pakistan side. So I think we need to come up uh, with uh, like a proactive uh, approach in a, in a way that collectively we need to highlight this issue. And just take example of Khalistan movement. India used to say that they don't, they are not worried by that, but now they are worrying by that. Specifically now they are focusing into uh, like uh, ban some certain movement uh, and also they are like forcing and they are like uh, generating different uh, kind of uh, content 
uh, to like uh, influence uh, Kennedy and Parliament at the same time. So I think they are getting in, uh, worrying by that situation too. So I think we need to hide, hide that rule at, at the same time because they are like almost two million people uh, who are from the uh, uh, sect and they are living in Canada and they are now forcing and they are becoming a big movement. Why we can't be like that? I think we need to uh, uh, have come up with a five-year plan and also at one time we need to uh, where uh, people of the international arena at the same time, we need to come up with resistance. Uh, we need to come up uh, with a proactive approach, uh, aggressive approach, and we need to support uh, those moments, specifically right now. If we take example of the last five years, we are not coming with the detail that what happened right now in, this, uh, in, the, in that area specifically. Mm. All the stats that we have, right, just you are, you are just mentioning it, these all stats are before 2015. There, is, there wasn't any kind of survey, there wasn't any kind of uh, statistically uh, it figure that we are getting after those uh, periods. So mm. I mean, maybe this number can be, yeah, definitely, it will be a huge number. And the killing might be more than 200,000. Right. But what the international uh, uh, fronts, uh, they're definitely saying, they're quoting that they are like 110K pe people have just died so far. But I think it will be more if we have, like just take example, uh, all the people know that they are like, I it's a huge mass uh, prison, but no one is speaking. Uh, even observer c coming here, but they they're not allowing them to go in that re region. Mm -hmm. So all people knows it. West knows it. How we have to influence that? We need to come up with uh, awareness campaign. At the same time, we need to uh, come up with supporting with the resistance. Specifically, we need to come up uh, s organizing a seminar. We need to uh, like f uh, yeah. Uh, th it's a fact that after uh, just take example of after 2019, we don't we do not have a funds to mm. give them. Before that, we yeah we were supporting th those mm. up front, but we, right now we are not supporting anymore. Right. Uh, how we can fix it when we are not working for the welfare of those? Sajad, people? very very quickly, you've talked about journalistic uh, iron dome as well that we've seen. We've talked about the blockade of journalistic activities happening over there as well. How can we create an indigenous movement towards journalism to providing in, in, uh, the information to the rest of the world? I think, yeah, we, we need to like organize a platform or we need to come up with a platform. We have to like make a platform where we can like uh, go for like uh, uh, inviting every person mm. specifically who are uh, who know this and who want to speak on this specifically. But yeah, th they will be uh, making more restriction on those people who will be coming or who will be coming as an invitee. I mean, so definitely we have to adhere uh, that we need to force an international uh, uh, diplomatic fronts and we need to make a platform. Just ex take example of OIC uh, that was being held, the OIC session was being held in Pakistan. That really m make a huge difference after that. So I think we need to uh, like come up with this idea again mm -hmm. and we need to uh, specifically uh, focus on Muslim community. And now India is like focusing and now he's infiltrating, uh, it is infiltrating into the OIC I think. So now we have to come up with more uh, proactive approach right. and we need to. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, now I'm going to go towards Oves. Oves, we have only a minute left now. Uh, very quickly, can we take a proactive approach after so much has happened? Yes, of course. You know, we have only one option and that option is that uh, we can exercise the uh, wherewithal uh, hmm. that is, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the soft power hmm. that we have earlier discussed. That, uh, uh, that uh, soft wherewithal, how we can exploit to project that and to um, showcase that uh, case uh, to the international community. And I think there is a wide room and there is a, a wide uh, area for improvement that we can work on that. And I think that uh, now it is the day, it is the time, 5th of February, we should take stock of our policy. Right. We should review our policy and we should identify the gaps uh, which we can fill hmm. to uh, uh, to have a more robust and more uh, uh, you know proactive approach right. towards Kashmir. Right. Thank you so much, Aves, for joining us. Aves bin Vasi, Kashmiri leader, Sajad Ghazmi, journalist, and thank you so much, Farzana Yaku, for joining us online as well. The former minister in the AJK Assembly, of course. We've talked about taking uh, the proactive approach, and we've talked about how on fifth of February this year. We need to look at and review the policy gaps and ensure that we take a more proactive approach and focus on the soft power and ensuring the lobbying in the different countries of Kashmiri leaders as well and the people of Kashmir as well in order to bring out the indigenous voices as well. Thank you so much for, for watching Perspective. You will watch us again next week. Take care of yourselves. Allah Hafiz.